Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wanted healthier, happier relationships or more love in your life, then do we have the Beyond Mars and Venus show for you. Today I'll be talking with John Gray, relationship expert and the incredible best-selling author of Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, and his latest Beyond Mars and Venus. And that's just what I want to talk with him about today, about relationship skills for today's complex world. But plus we'll talk about the power of hormones, meditating 16 hours a day, what we can all learn from Ed Sullivan and the Beatles, and why you don't go into a man's cave or you'll be burned by his dragon. So, <laughs> gotcha. So, welcome to the show, John. Are you ready to shine? Oh, yes, I'm ready to shine. What a delight to talk with you. And a delight to talk with you, John, as well. So, uh, first off, a mighty woohoo for having you on the show. Before we dive right into things, I'm absolutely fascinated by your story. Would you mind taking us back in time? First off, how did you end up getting blessed, blessed by the great Indian saint Yogananda? Oh. Well, when I was born, my uh, mother, well, I grew up in Houston, Texas. My mother was from <clears throat> Los Angeles, but I grew up in Houston, Texas. And she had an uh, esoteric bookstore, if you can imagine that, in Houston, Texas. For those of you in California, you know, one of the biggest esoteric bookstores was the Bodhi Tree Bookstore. My mm -hmm. mother started her bookstore the same year, and it was even bigger without any advertising ever. She just let people find her. It was quite an amazing childhood I had. I learned yoga when I was three years old. When I was a baby and I was born, my parents drove to, to uh, out at California from Houston to have me be blessed by Yogananda. Uh, they were very interesting parents that I had. So they were into the uh, spiritual side of things, the more esoteric side of the whole story. And yet they also, my mother had seven children and she loved being a mother and raised us all, six boys and one girl. And what religion were you raised with then? Well, Episcopalian was our religion. My mother basically said, we're, we're, you know, we're not so much into the dogma, we're into the, the, to God and spirituality. Uh, but Episcopalian had less rules, she said, and it was closer to our house. So, <laughs> you know, when I grew up, there's a picture of Christ, there's a picture of Krishna, there's a Buddha, you know, I, I didn't even know who these people were, but in my bedroom, I still had the little Buddha statue that I grew up with. It was in my bedroom that I just loved. And there was a picture of Shiva that my dad brought home from a trip from Canada. Beautiful. I've never seen one so beautiful. A picture of Shiva, which even to this day, in, in his meditative state. And I became a, later on, I became a big meditator. Didn't know that that was an uh, influence that was guiding me my whole life. But it's definitely there. Very, very cool. And, and if I understand right, at age 12, you may have had, I, I can only speak for myself, I had a bullying challenge growing up, and I wish I had learned karate. It sounds like you, you took it to a whole nother level. Well, you know, back in the day before the movie The Karate Kid, I was in Houston, Texas, The Karate Kid. My mother, uh, I was a little guy, so she took me to the karate place, and I excelled as a student, kind of a devotee of karate, and ended up in the front of karate magazines, because uh, I was so little, so it was unusual that uh, you know such a little kid could do all this karate stuff. And then my my teacher actually sent a brochure to all the kids at my junior high. <laughs> now now it's like gunslinger. Oh, like, no. <laughs> but anyway, I never got in many fights. I, I I would just say, okay, meet at the filling station at three fifteen, and I would just never go. So I'm not really into violence, but I was good at protecting myself. Very, very cool. So when, when did you start then getting interested in meditation? Well, ironically, it was my interest in, in martial arts that led me to meditation. A friend of mine said there was a samurai uh, warrior demonstration. And mm -hmm. what it was, he didn't understand the word. It was a seminar. <laughs> oh, no. So uh, I just happened to go to this meeting thinking it was a samurai. And it was a talk on transcendental meditation. I was 17 years old. And it blew my mind. When I came home, my dad said, where were you? I said, I was at a lecture. He couldn't believe it because I was so late. And, and I actually could repeat the whole lecture word by word. It was like it was already written in my heart. It was meant to be. I learned transcendental meditation. It was definitely a journey for me. Uh, it, it absorbed my mind. I just was so fascinated with enlightenment and the practices to bring us closer. I eventually became his personal assistant. This uh, is Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. Uh, yeah, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, the, uh, the TM movement founder, and became a TM teacher, became a teacher of teachers to help develop his university until I was about 28 years old and achieved the kind of enlightenment. Uh, I think there's many levels to enlightenment. 
But I, I definitely knew myself. I was one with the universe. I had unbounded consciousness. I used to hear the angels singing. I had all kinds of far out experiences. I'd been celibate for nine years as well. That was part of my own personal journey. It allows you to keep all the energy going up. And then it was time to bring the energy down and integrate it into my life. And my brother was bipolar. Meditation did not help that. So I could not be in my lofty, you know, blissful state thinking about my brother's suffering. So I left the TM movement. I went out to California to study psychology, thinking psychology could help my brother. So that's how I shifted from being this celibate yogi, devoted to God, <laughs> meditating for hours a day, to then coming out to the West, developing, studying psychology and the eternal living. I then began teaching seminars and what was most interesting to me, which was sex. Having not had sex for nine years, very active as a teenager, but then now I was free to enjoy sex. I called my seminar Enlightened Sexuality and sort of brought the spiritual aspect, the love aspect to sexuality as one of those early Tantra classes. And then I eventually moved on to, well, how do you keep the passion alive? It's easy to, to do it with someone you don't know or a new relationship, but to sustain it over time, I'm now married 32 years and experience and still sustain the attraction and love for my partner. So it all works in the bedroom, and many people are wanting that today, and part of it is learning how to grow together in a relationship, maintaining a freedom to express your authentic self, and that is a new challenge for people today. You know, never in history have people really aspired to have passion for a lifetime in their marriage. They knew it was a thing that was fleeting, so you didn't really pay much attention to that. You knew it would go away. But today, people want that lasting love. They want to keep feeling that passion, that connection. And that really is a kind of enlightenment of bringing the spirit down into the body. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's part of what I do is I teach that. Beautiful, beautiful. And and can you give us the 10-second version maybe? Because I think this is so important. You're somebody who's been in the trenches. How you met your wife, you didn't end up with your wife, and now you've been with your wife for 32 years. Well, it's a it's a longer story, but I'll give you the 10-second version. <laughs> or or is, a little bit longer because it's, it's so important. I, I fell in love with – once I was single and out on the road after being a monk for nine years, okay, a yogi, now I'm out enjoying lots of sex. So I had lots of girlfriends, and one of the girlfriends with Bonnie, and one of the girlfriends with Barbara. And I wanted to marry Bonnie, and then – but and I was in an open relationship. I told them all, I'm just exploring, I'm searching, and, and making up for lost time which was fun. And I was in love with Bonnie and decided I wanted to marry Bonnie, but I was still into open relationship idea. And she just did not go for that. So I ended up marrying Barbara. Uh, but that was just two years. And it was a devastating end. You know, she fell in love with somebody else. My heart was broken. And uh, I healed my heart. And then I called up Bonnie and said, I'm ready. And we got married a, a few months later. So it was, uh, and now we've been married 32 years. So I just really wasn't ready to marry Bonnie, and that's why she wouldn't marry me before. She was in love with me, but she felt like I just wasn't ready to get married. Part of the reason is I didn't even have a job at that time, <laughs> so, and there were other reasons as well. She had two little children from a previous marriage, and I really wasn't into kids, but I was happy to have kids. Part of what broke up my marriage with Barbara was I kept, after I started making money as a therapist and seminar leader, I started wanting to have children. You know, you can't think of children if you can't make a living. But then I started wanting children, and Barbara didn't want to have children. So I think that's what sort of caused the rift between us, ultimately. And and then now I'm ready to have kids, and I go back to Bonnie and say, I want to have kids, and I want to be married to you. And then we got married. Uh, you know, I proposed to her a month later, and we've been married now 32 years. Yeah, yeah. So what's also cool during this time, thank, thank you for sharing on that, is as you go back to do doctoral work, and if I understand right, your thesis ended up becoming uh, the outline for Men Are From Mars. So I'm wondering when you first started to get these ideas because you looked at relationships in a very different way. I did. I think that my spiritual background helped me to do that. As a counselor, I really learned as I was counseling people and discovered that what was being taught in the universities really wasn't helping that much people. I needed to have a more practical approach. Rather than trying to change people, my approach is don't ever try to change your partner. If you're trying to change your partner, you'll only get resistance, but you have to learn to change yourself. You know, if you're, not, if you're feeling resentful, how to let it go. If you're feeling angry, how to let it go. If you're feeling demanding, how to let it go. When you, Love is unconditional. When you can love your partner as they are, they're going to give you so much more. So what I saw was one, without trying to change men or women, 
I said, let's try to understand men and women better because women were not understanding men, men were not understanding women. And if I could explain things to people that they didn't know before, it wasn't like I said, you have to stop drinking. Everybody knows if you're an alcoholic, it's gonna sabotage your relationship. That's changing somebody. What I did is I worked on simply pointing out to people what they did not know. And that's what the birth of Minute from Mars was, is looking at things from a different perspective, not your own perspective, but from your partner's perspective. And then a lot of ideas evolved uh, you know, just pointing out to men, you know, you're all the time trying to tell women how they should feel. Mm -hmm. Don't feel this way. Don't be upset about this. Why are you mad about that? You shouldn't feel that. And if you don't try to change how she feels, but hear what's going on inside of her, she will come back to feeling her love. Likewise, women learn, don't try to change what men do, you know, accept men the way they are. Learn to appreciate what you are getting and you will get more. It doesn't mean you can't ask for what you want. It means you don't use emotions and complaining to manipulate men into changing because it doesn't work. So find a system that does work. So, you know, things like men go to their cave. You know, mm -hmm. women would think they didn't understand that. They thought, why isn't he showing me attention? Why isn't he interesting me? And I explained that for men, we cope with stress. The easiest way for us to cope with the stress of our day is to temporarily forget it. And that's what the cave is. It's a time where men needs to just forget everything, do something to distract his attention that's not that important, but he makes important, like a hobby or watching the news or, or a sporting event. Take our meditation, which is also important, a way to forget your problems. And that's a way for men to relax. But for women, it's to talk about and remember the day. So if he doesn't want to talk about his day, she think, was he mad at me? Because quite often when women are angry, it's because they'll shut up, they'll quiet up, and they'll withhold what they, they won't talk. So when a man didn't want to talk or had few words about his day, she thought he must not be, he must be angry with me, he doesn't care about me, I'm not important. So really what I did is, the reason it has such a big effect all around the world is just point out what people did not know about the opposite sex in a positive way. You know, people would always say to me, well, why are you looking at differences? Why don't we look at similarities? I go, conflict only arises when we don't understand differences in a positive light. So let's look at what those common differences are where we're not really understanding our partner, but instead we're projecting the worst on our partner when really there's not such a big problem at all. So there's, there's three levels of problems in life. One is where they're very real and you're a victim. And then you got to get out of that situation. The second level up as you become more enlightened, you have problems, but you realize that you contribute to them. And then if you change your behavior, you're going to get a different result. That's that person who's accountable. And then a third level up is to recognize that most of the time when you're upset or you're bothered, you're just believing something that's not true. And that's an old Indian philosophy, which is, you know, if you, you, you're in the dark and you see a snake and you get all upset about the snake and you start pounding the snake and whatever, then somebody turns on the light and you see it's just a stick. And all that excitement, all that upset had nothing to do with reality. So when couples start to see what works and what doesn't work, it's not so hard, but it does take practice to undo all of our conditioning in the past. And so that's why I wrote the book Beyond Mars and Venus, because we really need to go beyond the conditioning and how to free ourselves from that conditioning is the next step. So I got understanding men from Mars is understanding how men and women in a sense come from different places when they mm -hmm. approach things. And beyond Mars and Venus is new relationship skills to help women come back to their feminine side and help men come back to their masculine energy. Because what's happening today is women are like really stressed out quite often because they're on their masculine side. They're busy doing, 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 rather than relaxing and enjoying and loving. So how to help women come back to the feminine side, which in itself helps men come back to feeling stronger and clearer and more, more centered, less emotional about things, but more loving. So how to do that is a whole new subset of skills that weren't necessary before because people weren't spiritually conscious before. You see, when you become spiritually conscious and aware, what happens is you have access to both the yin and the yang energies, to both the masculine and the feminine energies. I am a blend of masculine and feminine energies. Everybody is. Thousands of years, men had to suppress their femininity to a great extent. Women had to suppress their masculine qualities, be dependent on a man and so forth. And now we're free since the 60s is growing freedom to be all that we can be. The problem is we haven't learned how to balance that because it's so refreshing if you're, you know, back in the 60s, I was protesting for peace, meditating, 
I was wearing bell-bottom pants. I grew out long hair. You know, getting high. You know, these are these are not masculine qualities. Masculine qualities: get out there and work hard, sacrifice, provide for your family, make money. That wasn't my interest at all. I wanted to grow in consciousness. Well, that was developing my female side. So I had to come back to my male side. Mm -hmm. And women have gone over to their male side and have a hard time coming back to their female side. And you know, most people can relate to that description. However, biologically, it's a fact. What you'll see today is that women's female hormones are much lower and their male hormones are much higher and that causes cortisol response. That causes the stress response. When a woman is experiencing a stress response in her body, her hormones are out of balance. Likewise, for men, it's the opposite balance. When men's testosterone is turning into estrogen, that's when men are angry or afraid or depressed or upset. You'll see that hormonal change and that's producing the stress hormones. So that, you know, my book's about how to identify your behaviors that stimulate male hormones, behaviors that stimulate female hormones. So when you're out of balance, you can come back into balance by doing those particular behaviors. One of the behaviors for men, for example, to rebuild testosterone, which is relevant to this interview, because mm -hmm. it's more spiritual, is learning to meditate. There's not, think about it. What do men, how do men cope with stress? It's like, we want to say, forget it. Don't worry about it. It's not a problem. Minimize it. Well, that's what meditation is. You're forgetting all your problems. You're emptying the mind. You're opening up the unbounded spaciousness and everything is okay. That's the masculine journey. The feminine journey is to love. And if she's not feeling love, to express how she feels. If she can express how she feels, she will always produce more estrogen. More estrogen will lower her stress levels at certain times of the month. At other times, progesterone lowers her stress levels. And but the, the hormonal shifts for women are very different from men. Testosterone is the magic hormone for men. Estrogen is the magic hormone for women. Fantastic. And, and, and I want to dive into all of this. I, I feel like if I go back a step, it's interesting when you started, uh, when you started this latest book, you're, you're talking about how it's a little bit of a confused world today. Where are we? Where do we stand? I remember a relationship that blew up on me before I met my wife, Jessica. And it was, it was good that it blew up. It was many years before that, where, where uh, the woman who, uh, well, she treated on me and cheated on me and then left me. And it, was, it, was, it takes two to tangle, not to cheat, but meaning the relationship was clearly out of balance. She, she came to me and said, why do I feel like I'm from Mars and you're from Venus? Right. It's not just you. It's so common today. It's like, uh, because what happens is if, if a culture does not allow women to be masculine, then the culture is constantly supporting their female hormones. And that does keep their stress down until the soul reaches a level of growth where it says, this is too confining. I want to express my male side too. I want to be independent, not so dependent. The part of us that needs love, that needs support, that yields and needs others, that's our female side. Our masculine side is more independent, more self-reliant, more analytical. Our female side is more emotional. And we're not putting people in a box here. We're saying that every person has both sides, mm -hmm. but one is the masculine hormones are stimulated when you detach, when you're independent, when you solve problems on your own, all that sort of uh, pulling away is to increase testosterone, objectivity is testosterone, subjectivity, emotions, feelings, love, empathy, compassion, all that is our female side. Female hormones get produced. And when a man has been in his male side for so long and suddenly has permission to go to his female, it's orgasmic. It feels fantastic. I remember just being so excited wearing my bell bottom pants and beads and long hair. It was just fabulous. But if you go too far that way, then as a man, you become more emotional than mm -hmm. detached. Then what happens is you become attached, too attached. You become irritable, grumpy, fearful, anxious, anxiety. Oh my gosh, when I went way to my female side, I had so much anxiety. Now that I've anchored in my masculine side, I understand the masculine energies. I make sure that I anchor to that as my female increases. I still have love and emotion and feeling, but it's positive is when men go weak on their male side, that's when mm -hmm. men become negative. When women go into a place of detachment and overwhelm and stress, I have so much to do, I have to do this, I have to do this, I can't relax, I can't think about myself, I'm not getting what I need. All of that focus is when women are producing too much testosterone and not enough estrogen or progesterone, depending upon where she is in her cycle. So 
this is now a reality. It felt so good for women. They just said, we're throwing off our bras. We're into the sexual revolution. We're going to be like men. And their male side came out. And then they found out they weren't happy. And they're not wondering what is going on. <clears throat> and so my message is to help us come back relationship skills that clearly are not instinctive. I mean, this is a new challenge. We don't have any conditioning. Our conditioning is to the past. This is a whole new challenge of what men can do and say and not do and say that will help women come back to their female side and what women have to be in order to come back to their female side and the support that they need from a man can be very helpful. Not that it's absolutely the only way, but an intimate relationship for it to thrive, there has to be a polarity where she's feeling more feminine and he's mm -hmm. feeling more masculine. Even for there to be that attraction, he has to be grounded in more testosterone. He must have at least 20 times more testosterone than her for her to even feel attraction. And she must have more than like 20 times more estrogen in order for him to feel drawn into her. Otherwise, the connection dissipates over time. So romantic skills, good communication, learning how to hear your partner and support your partner on both sides can help bring us back to and our relationship anchoring into our ground and masculinity for men, femininity for women. And then we can, we're free to express that other part, but not out of balance. Thank you. And I want to, I want to dive into a lot of the how to's today. Before we do that, since we're talking about meditation, we're talking about expanding our awareness. How do we start to recognize, and, and you, you hit on some of it with the stress, the list of, of stress symptoms. How do we start to recognize if we're uh, off kilter or out of balance with our masculine and our feminine sides? Okay. Well, typically speaking, and, and it's a really good point you're making because we have to recognize when we're out of balance if we're to come back in balance. Mm -hmm. Okay. You can't, you know, you're walking a tightrope going left and right. If you don't know I'm going too far to the right, you can't go back to the left. So you got to really be clear uh, when you're out of balance and where you have to go. Not just you're out of balance, you could be depressed. You know you're out of balance, but where do you go from there? Okay. Mm -hmm. If you're a man and you're depressed, for example, or if you're angry, or if you're irritable, or if you're grumpy, or if you have low energy, these are all signs that your female side. Female hormones are dominating your male hormones. That's it. And for women, if you're feeling detached, uh, you can't fall in love, men are not good enough, you don't like your job, you're feeling overwhelmed, life is dry, you're not able to relax and enjoy the pleasures of life, food is not tasting as good, you're not able to climax orgasm, you're not enjoying the sensuality of life, your life's not peaceful, that's a sign. Overwhelm generally is a good term for that. Overwhelm is a sign you're way on your male side. You've got to come back to your female side. So you recognize these symptoms and then you realize that you can't just do what feels natural at that time. You know, people say, I want to just be myself and be natural. Well, yeah, be natural when you're in balance. But if you're falling off to the side, it's not natural to go the other direction. The easiest mm -hmm. thing is to keep falling. That's why we fall over. You know, once you're falling over, keep falling. That's the path of least resistance. You have to face your resistance Women have to face their resistance to becoming more feminine. And what does that mean? That means to forgive. That means to be vulnerable. That means to be in touch with your emotions. That means to share your emotions. That means to open up, which doesn't always look so pretty. And for men, what does it mean to come back to your masculinity? Masculinity is independent. It's self-reliance. It's analytical. Mm -hmm. It's self-sufficient. It means don't complain ever. Never. I, you won't ever hear me complain unless I'm making a joke about it to some male friend of mine, making light of it. But to complain to my wife, why? Doesn't do any good. And for women to learn, so for women, men to realize that if you're angry, for example, mm -hmm. what is biologically happening in your body when a man gets angry is his testosterone, which is the male hormone, which needs to be much greater than his estrogen, 20 times more than a woman's. When the male hormone in that moment is actually turning into estrogen. I, I want to pause you because I, I had to read this twice, maybe even more than twice in the book to get this. When the toss testosterone, it's not too much testosterone that's making us angry. It's now in a sense too little testosterone. It's the conversion of testosterone into estrogen that makes us angry. If we just have low <laughs> testosterone, we're kind of passive and grumpy and irritable. If you get angry, literally what's happening is your testosterone, it's a hormone that interacts with an enzyme called aromatase that converts testosterone into estrogen. 
and what that and so you're becoming more feminine as you get angry anger is a response it's a fight or flight response when you're in fight or flight what happens in men if they're angry is the testosterone is literally turning into estrogen and we didn't know this before which is why you had to read it twice because historically the whole science thought that testosterone caused aggression and anger and violence in men no it's fight or flight that causes it and fight or flight is when a man is in danger so i could mm -hmm. be in danger as long as i feel confident and i know what to do to solve the problem that's the male side of me i know what to do to solve the problem i'm feeling confident then what happens is my testosterone gets higher and higher and higher to give me greater efficiency and more focus and more motivation and more energy but once i lose confidence and i don't know what to do that high testosterone now shoots into producing a huge amount of estrogen, which causes us to make to feel angry or to feel afraid, which is the fight or flight response. And at that time, when your testosterone is converting into estrogen, blood flow in your brain actually stops to the higher center, which is in the forehead here, and goes to the back part of the brain, which is instinct and conditioning. So you're no, you're no longer able to self-reflect at all. You're not able to change your conditioning. You will tend to repeat over and over the things that your ancestors did all the way back to cave people. You become like a monkey. And this is what happens to couples in relationship is they start squabbling back and forth like little children who haven't developed the front part of their brain, like monkeys arguing and fighting over trivialities and not and repeating the same pattern over and over and over. If you got the same argument going in your relationship, you're in the monkey brain. And it's called by scientists the monkey brain because all the DNA in that part of the brain is the same as a monkey's. And the back part, same as a, as a, as a, a cold, heartless lizard, okay? Cold-blooded back in the back part of the brain. And that's our instincts. They're all very primitive. We wanna stay up here and the meditation strengthens the front part of our brain. Detachment strengthens that if we follow our soul's intention. You know, if you say, I wanna go on a diet and not eat junk food, and you follow through, you're actually strengthening your prefrontal cortex, which says, I'm in charge of all these instincts. If you get angry, you need to know what to do if you wanna stay in the front part of the brain. Mm -hmm. So already, if you're angry and you're a man, it's because you're out of control. So you have to come back into control. How do you come back into control if you're a man? You have to stop the conversion of testosterone into estrogen. And the way you do that is to stop talking. That's why meditation was primarily taught to primitive men. Okay, men had to learn to detach. Rather than get emotional, men were taught to detach, give up attachment. This was all to help men increase testosterone. A testosterone is detachment, it's letting it go, it's seeing the positive. But for women, they were not taught meditation. Generally speaking, the masses of women were just taught to love your children, love your family. They really couldn't meditate. You talk, go to India now, you'll find out 99% of the people you say to women, can you meditate? They go, oh, no, it's too difficult because they hadn't yet developed their masculine side. But today women can mm -hmm. meditate, but they also need to focus on also using a meditation technique that also supports their feminine side as well. So chanting, singing, loving, devotion are still very powerful estrogen stimulators, but women who are on their male side can use the male side to practice meditation. Towards the end of our session, I'll teach a meditation, which is the yin-yang meditation. It's using both sides, the male and female sides. So for women, the way it looks is you're in a met, you can do any mantra meditation, any kind of meditation that you'd like, but at the same time, you're not just doing the meditation, you're also feeling the flow of divine energy. And it's like, I will activate everybody listening to this, this, the channels and their body. So when they're doing whatever practice they do, or simply mm -hmm. the practice I suggest, that they feel literally an energy flowing in their body the whole time. That's the secret of stimulating estrogen and testosterone at the same time, is you've got to focus, but you've got to flow, and they happen simultaneously. And they happen only simultaneously when you're actually feeling the grace of God flowing through your body, which is, you know, not everybody knows that they have this potential. Many of the meditation techniques, which are ancient, were for ancient people who didn't yet have this prefrontal cortex development where they could balance both the male female energies. You just have to learn how to do it. And it's like surprising. People can do it. It's the turn on. Uh, the, the energy flow. In the past, it was called the awakening of Shakti, the awakening of the Kundalini, 
uh, and the, the Shekinah, the all different types of traditions, masters would have this awakening. Anybody can do it now. You just have to have somebody point it out to you. Just like if I said, notice your, your big toe right now, you notice your big toe and you kind of go, oh, I wasn't aware of my big toe before he mentioned that. Well, we have this potential, which I could call a, a, a spiritual algebra, whereas most people are doing spiritual addition and subtraction and division and multiplication, or even remembering your numbers. Even when you're doing spiritual algebra, you're still using multiplication and division and plus. So you still do the other techniques, but you add to it a direct, concrete experience of the divine energy responding to your intention. And it's just a beautiful, easy to experience for anybody listening to this. And it's a power they didn't know they had. It's amazing. Beautiful. So I, I want to go into some of the different ways we can bring things back into balance. Before that, you just you just triggered an aha moment for me, which is I know that if I'm in, I'm in a heated situation or if I'm stressed or bothered by something, my best plan that I can do is go to my breath, go to all my different techniques, get myself back in a centered place, and then I'm good to go. However, if I start to talk about it, so if there's a challenging situation with my wife and myself, you were saying, the guy, don't talk. And if I went to to talk, I mess everything up, John. Correct. Correct. It's inevitable. If you have an emotional charge and you talk, all you're going to do is become more emotional. Estrogen is going to go up, which is going to cause her to become more testosterone. She has to defend herself. If a man becomes feminine, she becomes masculine. And so it's, it's just like craziness. <laughs> and so to just to have that awareness, don't talk, don't speak. But then do something that mm -hmm. will raise your testosterone. And you, the way you raise testosterone is to detach. So the easiest way to detach is to temporarily, consciously make the decision. Whatever we are talking about, whatever we got involved in, I'm going to temporarily forget it. Just like guys will say to each other, hey, forget it, don't worry about it. Just forget it, don't worry about it. But do something that will raise your testosterone at that point. Now, if you're a good meditator, you can meditate. If, you, if you're good at uh, basketball, go play basketball. If you're a good driver, go for a drive in your car. Uh, anything you're good at that's doing is generally a testosterone stimulator. For me, I can go down and start writing. I can start editing. Mm -hmm. Any type of activity I'm good at, I'm accomplished at, that means it's a channel to which I can feel successful. And meditation, if you feel successful at meditation, boom, you can just meditate. But quite often, even... If you're really plugged in and your emotions get really strong, it's good to do something physical with that actually stimulates more testosterone. Because when you, unless you're really accomplished at meditation, you may not make as much testosterone. It's just going to the gym, going jogging, but it needs to be something that you're good at. And that stimulates testosterone. You will feel better. Then you can think about what just happened. And then you look at, again, a male quality, a masculine side of us is accountability. Look at how you contributed to that conversation. Look at Absolutely. how your heart was not open. Look at how you were being judgmental. Look at your criticisms and consider, how would you feel if your partner felt that way about you? I remember one man I was counseling and he was just so negative. All he would do is list, 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 list all the negative qualities of his partner. And he would then turn around and say, she just doesn't love me and I love her so much. And I go, no, you don't. You have some illusion of what love is. To be that judgmental, that critical, wanting her to change is not love. And, and so get out of this relationship if you can't love her. Oh, I have to be in the relationship. That is called a relationship that's, that's dysfunctional, where you're wanting to be with somebody that you don't love, but you're critical of and you're judgmental of. Take responsibility for realizing that I'm not being loving. But he mm -hmm. wasn't able to see that. Because he's going, I would be loving if she didn't do this, if she didn't do this and do this. No, you're not being loving, period. So there are these three stages of relationships. The first is you're in a relationship where you're just, whatever your partner says or does, it causes you to respond in an unloving way and there's no way around it. So that's usually when your partner's dysfunctional and, and you're just as dysfunctional be in that relationship. So you got to get out with forgiveness and see how you contributed it by picking and being with the wrong person, mm -hmm. enabling, so to speak. Oh, then the flip side is moving to where you realize how do you contribute to the problems. That's the second level of developmental process to become a, you know, having a successful relationship. And as I mentioned in the beginning, when you start realizing that whenever things go south, there's always you there. <laughs> You're always a part of it. 
And when you can understand that, then you can also realize that you do your best. Your partner's always there as well. They're contributing mm -hmm. too, but you forgive them because they don't know better. You don't know better. You deserve to be forgiven. They deserve to be forgiven. And you learn how to contribute to a successful relationship. And then you move to the stage, which really is what Men from Mars is all about, is looking at, you know, there really isn't that big of a problem here. I mean, ultimately, uh, <laughs> we're, we're so lucky in America. <laughs> Other people will be so happy to have the problems we have. We, we just make up our problems. We create so much drama. And to be able to see that the way men and women relate, we're often just thinking that we're doing the right thing and therefore we should get the right response rather than realizing it's not that big of a problem. We're just creating it, making it worse. Thank you. Let's. Let, I want to talk about the stage for a bit. The, the the last piece that I have before we do that is we've got some coping mechanisms for men to do to raise their testosterone if they're in, uh, say, a sticky situation with their partner. What's the woman to do? Uh, the woman has to disengage from talking. Now, and she has to shift her direction from talking to him about what she feels, because he can't hear it, and shift the direction over to somebody who can hear it. That would be a friend. That would be a coach. That would be a prayer to God. But she needs to articulate and express her feelings with no sense of accountability. See, some spiritual people, they kind of go, okay, I'm responsible for my life. I'm accountable. That is masculinity. And th th what we men do is, you know, we'll say, okay, I made a mistake, but what's your mistake? And you need to apologize. We're trying to get her to be accountable. She will be accountable, but first she needs to lower her stress because mm -hmm. accountability is a very male quality. That's masculinity. It's analyze, see how you contribute to problems, solve the problem. You can't solve a problem unless you see that you're contributing to it because <laughs> you can't change other people, but you can learn to love them, which will bring out the best in them. So women have to disengage from, a, from their partner, which is that letting go of the demand that he be everything for her and realize that there aren't human beings on this planet that can keep their heart open while you're ripping in the shreds. And complaining to a husband, nagging a husband, criticizing a husband, getting upset with a husband, mistrusting him, looking at him with those disapproving eyes will cause his brain to react in a conditioned response, particularly if he's having sex with you. If you stop having sex, you can deal with it better. But if you want to feel passion, that means you're connected. So mm -hmm. if she's having negative thoughts about me, very hard for me to like be 100% there for her. I can try. To a certain extent, I can do that for a certain period of time, but if I notice I'm getting angry, now I'm in fight or flight, we have a code phrase, which is simply, I hear you. She knows that anything she says to me after that will only create more resistance in me, literally like bruising me. I mean, I can be very enlightened, I can be super Tai Chi karate guy, but if you pound me, I will bruise. Everybody will. So a man needs to know where he's starting to get bruised, where he's starting to go in that fight or flight response, and then give a signal to protect her from the dragon inside. You're protecting her and she needs to learn that's his gift of love to stop talking. Because what women will tend to do when a guy stops talking is follow him and ask questions and try to get him to talk. And why does she want to get him to talk? Because she thinks he's a woman who needs to talk in order to feel better. Because if you talk when you're emotionally upset, estrogen increases, that lowers testosterone in men. But for women, they need to lower their testosterone, bring them back to expressing their emotions, which can be irrational, which can be victim-like, which can be complaining, but not to him. Go to somebody else who will empathize, who relates. And then as you express those feelings, your stress levels will go down, then blood flow will return to the front part of your brain where you're able to remember that nobody's perfect, that we all contribute to the problems in our life, that ultimately learning to overcome these challenges is a gift from God. It's what builds character. It's what real love is about. You know, to love someone who's perfect is not real love. Anybody who gives to me everything I want, I'm going to love. It's when they can't always give me what I want and I still love them. That is the test of love. That's how we grow in love. Growing in love is like building muscles. If I wanted to build muscles, if I wanted them to be bigger, I go to the gym more often and I don't pick up light weights. I pick up heavy weights. And then you build muscles. You have to be challenged to build muscles. Same thing with love. To grow in a heart which is open all the time, you need to be broken many, many times. So you learn how to find forgiveness and acceptance and understanding and empathy. These are things that grow over time. They're not just read a book and be that way. It's read a book, be inspired to be that way, and practice it. But for women, the easiest way is to recognize hormonally when you're in a place of unhappiness, you need to get in touch with what you're feeling, brutally honest about what you're feeling, 
to somebody who's not the person who's the object of your complaint. Thank you. So many different directions we, we can go with this. First off, one of the things you're saying about, about the relationships and difficulties is I've had some very good friends who they get in a relationship, the relationship hits, hits a tough spot. There's one friend in particular I'm thinking of, and he bolts because that clearly wasn't a very good relationship. But what you're saying is that relationships have their difficulties can actually, to a certain extent, be a very positive if you learn how to work through them at strengthening your muscle of relationships. Correct. So I, I, a fun story to back that up. I was once had a chauffeur, a limo driver, and I said, well, how are your relationships? He said, oh, I think I'm jinxed. I said, before you speak anything more, let me tell you, let me describe your relationship. And I said, you get together and she's always positive and happy and everything's getting really good. And then suddenly she starts sharing feelings and she's unhappy about this and unhappy about that. And then you think she's crazy and then you end the relationship. And he goes, yeah, how do you know? How do you know? I've only attracted the crazy women. They all need therapy. They all need therapy. And I said, oh, no. I know because they all need therapy. Or at least they all need this understanding of how to express their feelings. And when women are on their male side, if they get triggered and they express what's inside, it will typically come out irrational. It won't be accountable. It won't be logical. It needs to go over to the irrational side in order to increase that estrogen. Anything which is rational, logical, accountable, reasonable is going to produce testosterone. Nothing wrong with that. Women have that side of them, but they need to give themselves permission to go all the way to the other side of no reason. And it's like irrational for a while. And men need to create a space for that to occur. And until men become really good at this, she needs to let that come out on somebody else if it's about him. But what she can do is come home and share things about other people, other situations, other things that he's not being blamed for. And you're not asking him to change in order to fix it or solve it. So you clearly say, I just want to talk for 10 minutes about my feelings and my frustrations today. It feels good to vent them. You don't have to say anything. I just want you to understand so I feel connected to you. You see, so many times women make the mistake of asking men questions about their day when he wants to forget his day, but she wants to feel connected. And so if he opens up and shares, she can go into him and feel connected. But she has to realize that whenever she wants to go into him to connect, she is actually reversing the polarity in the relationship, making him the girl, and she becomes the man who's penetrating the partner. She has to look at the fact that really inside she's afraid, she feels uncomfortable sharing about her day because if she actually shared what's inside of her and he was able to hear her, he's penetrating her and she will feel connection. What we're looking for is connection. I can be the girl and she can penetrate me or she can be the girl and I penetrate her by listening. And that's another aha in the book, which is when you're listening, you're actually in your masculine energy. When you're sharing, you're in your female energy. Why? Because when I'm listening, where am I going? I'm going into her. And where, when she's being heard, what's happening? He's coming into her. And that's where you experience connection. So you can experience connection one way or the other way. Making him into a female, particularly if he's stressed, is the worst thing ever because it's going to raise his estrogen, lower his testosterone, and destroy the polarity in the relationship. And usually women who are like really into it, we got to know what you're feeling and what you're thinking, what's there. I don't feel connected, what's happening. It's because they're not sharing what's inside of them. And granted, they don't know how to. They don't feel safe to. Their partner wouldn't listen anyway because if he's not educated, he'll tell her, well, don't worry about that. Well, that's irrational. Or you're just being a victim. How many times are you going to go over this? You ought to do this and this and this and get over it. It's no big deal. Well, yeah, that's what men can do for themselves to detach that increases testosterone. The opposite of that is what creates estrogen, which is simply tell me more, help me understand that better. What else you feel? What were you thinking? What are you wishing? What do you hope? Find out, go into her and she has to open up, but she has to stay off the subject of him. Otherwise he gets plugged in and now we go nowhere. Thank you. What, what are a few other ways, first for the women, then for the men to help bring us back into balance? Well, to come back into balance for women, expressing female, if you're too masculine, the sign, we looked at the signs, where the signs of being too masculine if you're a woman is detachment, mm -hmm. lack of love, resentment, overwhelm, uh, busyness, busy, 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 okay, can't relax. 
that's you're on your male side. You want to come back to your female energy. Now, there's two situations that create female hormones to get you out of your male hormone. For the, for the uh, first 12 days after your period, the main hormone is estrogen needs to eventually double, go to 20 times greater than a man's. Now, during that time, the relationships that stimulate estrogen are called pair bonding. Mm -hmm. Pair bonding is where you are dependent on someone for something. If you go to a doctor and you're dependent on their advice for your health, then you're pair bonding. If you go to your priest, confession, you're going, you're pair bonding. You're praying to God, you're actually pair bonding. You're going to somebody, something that has something that you need that you can't provide for yourself. That is pair bonding. That stimulates testosterone in men if they're providing it, the support, and it stimulates estrogen in women if they're receiving the support. Now, after ovulation, this is 12 days after her period, uh, what happened, 10 to 12 days, then she still needs estrogen for the next 12 days, mm -hmm. but, and these are approximate times, but she needs more progesterone. Now, progesterone, if, if it's not higher than estrogen, she will be stressed out. So what produces progesterone is not pair bonding. It is social bonding. That means having a life that's not dependent on the man in your life. That means having a life where you've got lots of women, where you're both sharing the same experience of life. It could be some men mixed in there too, but you're not in a situation where you're depending on the man or the woman for anything that you really need. You're both contributing, like we're playing cards, or we're playing a game, or we're going on a vacation, or we're eating out, or we're having a celebration. You know, these kinds of reading together, uh, you know, togetherness or alone time. If you're doing something for yourself, which you love to do, not because you have to do it for others, but you're doing something for yourself at a selfish time, either selfish time or, or me time or, or sharing with other girlfriends or in a gender neutral way, that produces progesterone. So 12 days of the month, she needs estrogen. And the other time she needs some estrogen, but more progesterone. And so understanding that, we see that if women, when they're stressed, can just mm -hmm. focus on doing things that they love to do, doing things that they enjoy doing, doing things that make them feel beautiful. Beauty is a very feminine quality. Expressing your feminine qualities, loving, nurturing, helping, being helped, asking for help, getting help, needing support, being transparent, vulnerability, these are all aspects of femininity. So go shopping if you enjoy shopping. It's a big estrogen stimulator is shopping. Uh, go get a massage, big estrogen stimulator. Go to the spa, big estrogen stimulator, but particularly on the first 12 days after your period. On the other side, make mm -hmm. sure that you're actively engaged in sharing activities or doing things for yourself. That's called me time, where you're doing it because it's enjoyable and it's pleasurable. And this is not all the time. This is what you do to balance those eight to 10 hours where you have to be like a man earning money. Just think of it. Anything you do to make money is making testosterone. Anything you do which is selfless is making testosterone, except the selflessness of being a mother. When you're being a mother and you're selfless, you're making testosterone, but the child is giving you so much, so much unconditional love that you feel safe. So you're making a lot of estrogen and testosterone. That's why being a mother is such a beautiful thing when it's working for you. So these are the things women can give themselves permission to do. So a lot of what I just said is really having an intellectual framework that gives women permission to do what seems selfish. Because in the past, women didn't need that because of their lifestyle was such that it nurtured the pure female side. It was depending on a man, it was routine, it was rhythmic, it was doing nurturing activities. These are all things that were constantly giving her the estrogen and then the progesterone is in a tribe with other women sharing the responsibilities of parenting and cooking and cleaning as a group. That gave her a sense of security, estrogen, as well as a sharing progesterone. So these are you know, we have to update this and realize that if you're way on the masculine, you need more of those things to bring mm -hmm. you to the feminine, more intensity, which means uh, more romance, uh, the sharing of vulnerability, this transparency. 
you know, historically women never did this kind of transparency and they didn't even have the self-reflection to be able to step back and articulate what they feel. They would become emotional, but they couldn't, in a sense, have presence and feel their emotions without acting on them, without becoming them. But there's a sense of detachment as well as emotion. And that's our state of enlightenment. That's our, that's the, the enlightenment we're seeking is to balance the yin and the yang. So you win that state, your blood flow goes to the front part of the brain, you can self-reflect, and now you can uh, release that conditioning by recognizing, is this really gonna work for me? And you choose not to. You know, people say everything's a choice, but when you're in the monkey brain or the fight or flight, there are no choices. Literally, it's conditioning. It's all programming and conditioning. But when here is where you have choice. So you have to constantly prioritize coming back to this balanced state for women, do things to create estrogen and progesterone. For men, do things to detach, detach from trying to change, detach from being dependent on anybody or anything external to make you happy and fulfilled. Do it yourself. So if you turn to your bottle of alcohol, you're actually attached to the, that you're using the alcohol, you're going into estrogen land if you do too much. A little bit of alcohol will cut, for many men, the, the edge. But if you, go, you start becoming dependent upon alcohol to drown yourself in your sorrows, you're way over in the female side. Same thing with drugs, same thing with junk food, same thing with too much TV, too many video games. It's all becoming too dependent on something external for my happiness. That's where meditation comes in. That's mm -hmm. where spiritual practice comes in, is finding that I am the source of my happiness. I'm not dependent on external realities to be happy. Part of my training, which is not everybody's, I'm a bit of an extremist, but now I'm extremely moderate. But in my younger days, you know, I learned that you have to detach from all your sensory pleasures. So I never masturbated, I didn't have sex, I, I ate a bowl of food every day, I slept on the floor without a pillow but on my arm, I got into ice cold bath every morning. And I didn't do this for the full nine years, there'd be periods where I would do that, but it was practicing discipline. Discipline which says I'm gonna do what I believe to be right and not follow my impulses or my feelings. I gotta detach from pleasure and comfort and do that which is difficult, that which is challenging, but serves a higher purpose. You know, for the ultimate of masculinity is sacrificing your own whims and wishes and feelings, sacrificing your comfort for the greater good. Slaying and, you know, the dragon. Slaying the dragon. You get out there and you don't whine, you don't complain, and you know if your testosterone's up, things don't hurt anyway. <laughs> but, they, they, but what then happens is you get enlightened, you have masculine and feminine, and then you feel the pain. Like as I watch all the tragedies or the catastrophes on the news, as part of my meditative practice, is I hear, I see the, the traumas that are happening in other parts of the world on the news and I meditate, and, and that's my compassion meditation. And literally tears just come down my eyes as I'm feeling the pain of other people, feeling the compassion, which is a part of being a human being, not to ignore that, but to fully feel that. And doing my prayers that, that happiness and goodness and hope and faith come to these people. And that's calling on their angels to help them. That's what we can do through prayer, is people are ultimately responsible for everything in their lives. But what we can do, we can't change their karma, we can help them find the more uh, uh, safe part of their being to find their true self. Because when their true self emerges, it negates negative karmas. Uh, basically, there's action and reaction. It's a law in the universe. But the universe reflects what we're putting out to a great extent. And so if you can help people come back to finding forgiveness and having hope and having faith and loving themselves and forgiving their mistakes, just letting that love, unconditional love come in, that can help people find themselves. And as they find their true self, they're shifting the way the world responds to them. If I'm coming from a mistrusting place, then the world is mistrusting. If I come from a place of greater innocence and love, then the, I find people to support me in that. At the same time, we have to have, uh, re we have to live in this world, realistic. You know, mm -hmm. there was a lesson I had to learn. All my great bounty in my life really comes from my inner there's an inner innocence where I forgive my mistakes and a belief, a deep, deep-seated belief, which I'm sure you got when you passed over to the other side, is that the universe is benevolent and it's here mm -hmm. to serve us. Everything that happens to us is to help us grow and have more and more. And we are all loved and we are all forgiven and accepted. Nobody really doesn't have to be forgiven, although because we are, we are trying to do our best. And that is true at all times for everybody. They're just lost and confused. So when we can know this as deep inside and, and 
part of my spirit is very clear about that. And part of it was a gift from my mother. My mother was a very spiritual person and, and never saw her upset or anything. She's pure grace. Uh, and she had a belief and experience of life that no matter what is happening around you, you're always getting what you need. And if you don't feel you're yeah. getting what you need, then you're looking in the wrong direction. It's always here. But we're kind of like, I want, I want my wife to be this way, this way, this way, when actually let her be that way today. Go out and play tennis and come back and she's changed. Don't be so needy to depend on everybody changing to, to fit your whims, but to look around and realize that there's what you need is here. So she taught me that by her example, that you always have what you need and life is grace. And so when I have that, I pull in great success, but I also had to ground it because I was so trusting that people would come in and, and defraud me and sue me and I, I, cause I didn't have contract cause I just shook my hands and whatever. And, and now I'm famous in deep pockets. People do that. So you have to have your guard up, but at the same time, trust the best in people, but also the trust that some people aren't capable of, of fulfilling your expectations. It's not all just going to be, the, the good comes to you. It seems that the bigger you get in your consciousness, you're constantly tested again and again. And some of my lessons have been to love people, but also to know some people are not thinking of my best good. Uh, and part of my lesson is to learn to set those boundaries and, instead of just be a doormat for anybody to do anything to me. So that, you know, life is complicated. Every stage of the way we have our lessons to learn. For some people, it's learning to find forgiveness. For other people, it's your heart's so open, you have to learn to set boundaries. It's not yes to everybody. Just one quick question, then I want to jump into some wrap-up questions and a brief meditation. I, I'm so looking forward to your meditation. Um, this is a, a strange segue, but um, cuddling and sleep. Okay. Cuddling is, stimulates... Ex, uh, when, you, when, you, when you ever have affectionate, non-sexual touching, we'll call it cuddling. It can be stroking her hair, stroking my hair, it can be touching, it can be spooning. When you're uh, hugging is a really wonderful hug. Uh, they've actually measured six-second hug. Just hug in there and stay six seconds. For, uh, for a woman and for a man, the hormone oxytocin increases. Now what oxytocin does is it allows estrogen to go up and it reduces women's stress levels. What oxytocin does for men and for women is it lowers testosterone. So if I have low testosterone, I'm not gonna wanna hug. But if my testosterone is really high, hugging can actually bring it down to a balanced level. And if I know that I'm actually giving my wife a gift and this is what she needs, then my testosterone will stay up even while I'm enjoying the feeling of the hug. So it's, a, it's, a, it's like a mind thing. If I know my hug is, is doing something for her, then I can fully enjoy it. My oxytocin goes up, my estrogen goes up, but my testosterone stays up. If I don't know the value of hugging for her, then I'm just hugging, oxytocin increases, my testosterone goes down, and I go, what's the point of a hug? Let's have sex. So it's really understanding what we think about how we interpret the world stimulates the right hormones or the wrong hormones. So, and if you have oxytocin, the other night my wife couldn't sleep and I said, let me just hold you. And I held her for like five minutes and then she said it, she's able to sleep because that infection will raise the estrogen, lower the testosterone, and now she's not super busy thinking of everything. Thank you, thank you, thank you, John. And I'm, I'm going to use that, that tool myself. So first off, I want to take my coaching hat. Take it off me, throw it on you. What one homework assignment would you give people today so that they're not just listening to this interview, but they take action? Write down three things, if you're a woman, that you love to do and you often don't do for yourself. And then when you're upset with your partner, stop talking to him and go do those things. And include on that list someone you can talk to about your feelings or at least journal your feelings. Even if you don't like doing that, that's something you need to add to the list. But three things that you love to do, you should do at those times when you're upset with your partner. Go and do those things. Second for men is have same thing, list of three things you're good at that you can do, particularly if they use muscles or if you're good at meditation, you can put that in there or yoga or exercise. Or you can get in the physical body doing something you're confident with when you're stressed out with your partner before mm -hmm. interacting with them or after an interaction, during interaction, Take a time out. You have a list of three things you can go and do and practice doing those things and ideally do the things that you resist most. Uh, that's, you know, a good thing because usually your resistance, when you have resistance, uh, it's, it's uh, a sign that a part of you is out of balance. And so the way to get back into balance is to overcome that resistance and do that thing that intellectually you know is the right thing for you. Uh, and particularly for men, that's such a good thing to do. 
But for women, they also will have resistance to becoming in touch with their feelings and so forth. So you have to use a little bit of your male power to get in there and say, we're going to let this woman feel safe to open up and share. So that's three things. And the other thing I would suggest is we're going to do our meditation is practice this meditation technique for 10 minutes, uh, at least uh, every day for the next couple of weeks till you really get anchored into what I'm going to awaken or help awaken inside of the people doing the meditation. Brilliant. I'll get there as fast as fast as I can. First off, any words of wisdom you give for parents for their kids today? All right. Well, I've written a whole book called uh, uh, Children Are From Heaven. Uh, men are from Mars, women are from Venus, children are from heaven, if you know how to parent them. <laughs> Otherwise, they're from the other place. Uh, <laughs> and so what, one real quick thing is so many times uh, uh, fathers don't realize the effect that they have on their kids in terms of the relationship with their mother. Bonnie used to complain that the kids don't listen to her and they only listen to me. So I analyzed that and realized that many times she'll ask me to do things and I'll say, I'll get there later. And they would see me postponing her request. So they thought that I'm more important. And then they would now postpone her request. So she'd say, dinner's ready. Because she usually did the cooking. And she said, dinner's ready. And I said, I'll be in a few minutes. Kids go in now. Well, that says dad's more important and mom's not so important. Just that little action. The big one was I would come home. My kids would all run up to me. I'd interact with them. I'd play games with them. In a sense, ignoring the mother. And what I had to do is a quick change is when I came home, first thing I'd say to my kids, they jump in my arms and everything. I say, where's your mom? And we go find the mom and I give her a hug first. You know, I give her my attention, spend some time with them. And they'd be pulling on me. I say, I'll get to you. I'll get to you. Children need to get the message that the spouse is more important than the kids. And that's contrary to a lot of people feel because kids give you so much love that just pours out of you. But the more you can give, and that would be the other way around. If a, a mother is complaining about her husband to the kids, oh, your father, he's forgotten again. I can't believe he does that. How many times do I have to tell him? They're just giving this message to the child. They don't realize that in that child, a little girl's learning you can't trust men, and a little boy's learning is you can't make a woman happy. Uh, you're not good enough. Don't be like dad. So bad-mouthing each other is not a good thing, ultimately, but particularly in front of your children. The love you share with each other is one of the greatest parenting gifts you can give to your kids. And to have conflict in front of your kids or conflict where the kids can hear it is not a good thing. And to hold on to conflict for long periods of time and have silent wars is also not good for kids because when you suppress the conflict you have with your partner, your kids will feel it and act out. Evidence of that is, you know, when your kids and when the little kids, when they – they get all throwing, start. They throw tantrums in the grocery store. Why in the grocery store? Because that's where you're you're trying to like hold a lid on it. You're, you're trying to get the kid to stay quiet, keep quiet. And the more you push them down, the more they expand. And it's also if you notice on a stressful day, uh, that's when your children act out the most. Because if inside yourself you're trying to mm -hmm. put a lid in it, you're feeling so stressed, you're pushing it all down. Kids will act out, and then you resist them more, just like you're resisting inside yourself. So make sure you take the time to balance your own hormones to make sure you're lowering stress in your life, and that's going to be the greatest gift to your children you can give. Thank you so much, Don. What personally brings you the greatest happiness, or what I call the woohoo factor? Um, well, you know, I, I, I love having sex with my wife. Uh, I love spending time with my children who are now grown now. I play with my grandchildren, and I love my work. Uh, when I get into writing, I go into an ecstatic state, which is orgasmic in a sense, but not sexual. And when I'm able to teach, I love teaching. And one of my favorite things, I love being on stage and I'm, I'm ecstatic. I have no anxiety. I have no resistance to teaching. It just flows. I love talking about this stuff, sharing, because I know I'm making a difference in people's lives. I love to travel. I travel to over 50 countries. I teach these ideas in different countries. It's really fun for me. I'm a good traveler. Uh, and, the, and the last, which is the most fun, is my Radiant Mind seminars that I do. Uh, we have one coming up at the end of this month. Uh, it's a two-day seminar where I get to activate in person people's uh, kundalini energy, shakti energy, divine mm -hmm. energy, or we can just call it the healing energy channels. And uh, I call forth their angels and activate that. And it's very much like if you want to play tennis and you play with somebody who doesn't know how to play tennis, your game's not going to be so great. But if you play tennis with somebody who's an expert, your game will automatically improve. We tend to resonate with the people we're connected to. So if people are connected to me, it's very easy uh, for me to activate their energies and then to practice the technique that I teach with it for a while. Then you can use the energy any way you want. 
part of what my class is about is teaching six different ways to use the energy. But the first step is activating it, awakening it. And just being in the awakened state is so soothing to the body. So that's step one. And we can do that now if you'd like. Yeah, let's do that. First off, give me your URL, please, so people can find your book and find your work and find your upcoming programs. Oh, that's so much fun. Thank you. It's called uh, uh, MarsVenus.com. So MarsVenus.com is my website. Uh, something we didn't mention that you can go on the website and find is also the nutritional support for higher consciousness. There's a, there's a paradox here happening today is that we see traditional techniques for enlightenment at a time where people ate only organic food and had clean air and clean water. And now we have this greater potential to do the elevated consciousness in this time of transformation we're living in to achieve enlightenment easier in the different levels of enlightenment. But we don't have the nutritional support to support it. So I'm really big into learning the important minerals that are necessary associated with ecstatic states of the brain to sustain that and amino acids and improving digestion because when you're more enlightened, you have more in chance of going too far to the female side if you're a man, too far to go to the male side if you're a woman. So your stress levels are actually higher, and that's what I see today. Wow. And so when you're under stress, your body doesn't digest properly. There's things that you can take to help the body come back into balance, just as psychologically we need to treat the body. I didn't talk about that. We don't need to get into that because it's all over my website if you go to health blogs. Uh, and then I have a store with videos of different things you can get at the health store, either on my site or any other site, things in different protocols that will help your brain find balance. So that's A. And then B is, that's MarsVenus.com. Mm -hmm. Every day there's a one-hour talk that people can hear from me, a seminar on different topics from health to spirituality to wellness to parenting to gender. All that stuff is there. It's fun. We give a schedule for the week. That's there. And... Uh, but what's not there is this meditation. I do this only in person with people when they're hearing me, so I'm happy to do that. And I do have my two-day Radiant Mind seminar I do three times a year. And it is coming up at the end of the month, and I want to invite people who would like to come to participate in that. You'll enjoy it. It's in Marin County. Uh, but shall we begin the meditation? Absolutely. And uh, for those driving down the road, you probably want to pause this and do it later when you, have, when you can be fully present with the experience. Yeah, that would be great. And it's really good if you listen to me talk for a little while because part of it is connection. It's very easy. We're so connected right now and listening to all these ideas. People are literally, we're, we're one. And so it's very easy for me to help activate this divine energy inside of people. And it's, it's literally like just putting your awareness on a power that you didn't know you had. Mm -hmm. Just like if I was to suggest that you notice your big toe uh, of your right foot you now notice your big toe and your right foot. You weren't aware of it before. It was there, but you weren't necessarily aware of it. Now you can be aware of the toenail and, and how it's touching the ground. So it's like, where do we put our awareness? It turns out that the secret of the ages that only the masters knew, they didn't teach the regular people, the masses, because they couldn't do it. But today the consciousness is expanded. As we blend our masculine and feminine energies together, this capacity is able to, uh, to be sustained. It's the ability to focus and flow at the same time. And the, the whole key to this is to feel the flow of energy. It's kinesthetic. You'll experience it to different degrees. People will experience it. Uh, but if they practice, they'll experience it more. So the turn on switch is simply fingertips. Mm -hmm. Fingertips is the turn on switch. And in a moment, so for those that are watching the show, put your hands up in front of you. You can see how I'm doing it here. But it's just elevating the hands uh, you know, in front of the chin, you know, somewhere in front of you and just holding them up for a moment and noticing your fingertips. And because we've been connecting so much already, you know, you're starting to feel some buzzing, some little electricity or, or warmth or sensation in your fingertips. It's like right there. It's just the intent to turn on the energy channels. So then to strengthen the intent, there's a little prayer that I'll say and to activate the fingertips. And then when people use this prayer, the fingertips will just turn on, particularly if you do this for 10 minutes uh, for the next you know, 10 days or so, just to anchor into this once you experience it. Now already I'm turning on more just with my intention, whether I'm saying the words, but when you say the words, uh, it strengthens the intention. So what is our intention as we do this little exercise? The intention is to connect with our higher power, to connect with the divine force of the universe, the chi energy, the pranic energy, the Holy Spirit, 
the angel energy, whatever you want to call it, there's a divine energy that keeps us alive. It's a life force. So you shift, you can turn on that life force to feel it. Once you feel it, you can increase it and you can do things with it. So the first thing we're going to do is just turn on the energy. That's the purpose of this meditation is activate your capacity to feel this energy at any time. So with the fingers up, we're now just aware of the fingertips and we're going to just do this little intentional phrase and I'll say it as we just sort of feel it along with me. It goes like this and the words are not that magical. They're just making a clear intent. The, the intent is there's a higher force. Come on down into my awareness. Activate the channels in my fingertips. So it's a little bit more poetic, this a phrase, because poetry evokes more feeling as opposed to being too analytical. So I've just given the analysis of what we're doing. We're activating the, the life force in our body through becoming aware of the switches, which are in our fingertips. Now, why in the fingertips? If you want to feel, if you want to touch somebody, which feel them, you use your fingertips. We're designed to feel through our fingertips as the easiest channel. So not that I couldn't do it by thinking about my toes or my, my knees or my eyes, but the easiest way is fingertips. And you'll see all the great sages and Jesus has got his hands up like this and Buddha's got his fingertips open as he's sitting in his lap. It's uh, Kuan Yin, all the different deities they use. Their hands are in different positions. It's anchoring in a certain use of the energy with an awareness of the fingertips. Eventually, you become aware of different points in your palm. But for now, turning on the energy is fingertips. So the phrase, that's the analytical part. Now we do the poetry part, the heartfelt part. Dear God, our hearts are open to you. Please come, sit in our hearts. Come now. We really need your help. We need your help to activate the healing channels in our bodies, in our hearts, in our mind, in our spirit, so we can feel your presence. We need your help. Please come. We need your help. And feel inside a longing for help to awaken your connection to divine even more, to help you in guiding you in your life, to feel more love, to feel more happiness, whatever it is. Feel your need. That's the female side of us, the need for help. So dear God, our hearts are open to you. Please come. We need your help. Send your healing angels. Thank you. So that's the simple part of the prayers. Dear God, if I was doing it alone, it would be, Dear God, my heart is open to you. Please come. I need your help. Send your healing angels. Right now, send your healing angels to awaken the channels in our fingertips. Thank you. And thank you is the short version of thank you, God, through your grace, by your healing angels, in this moment, you're now awakening the energy channels in our fingertips. Now that's the beginning. That's how we do it when I'm awakening. Okay, so we'll just do that a few times. I'm gonna say the prayer again. You just think along with me. Dear God, our hearts are open to you. Please come, sit in our hearts right now. We really need your help to awaken the energy channels in our fingertips so we can feel the energy flow. Just starting with an awareness of increased energy or sensation in the fingertips. That's the first step. Right now, send your healing angels to activate the healing channels in the fingertips. Right now, by your healing angels, activate the channels in the fingertips. Thank you. Now, right now, you're feeling the energy flow, right? We're in a field of energy together. Now, that's, that's just the beginning. Now, what you can do at home is you take a natural object. That natural object would be a candle burning or a beautiful crystal or uh, water, a bowl of water or a swimming pool or a shower or a lake, an ocean, something natural, one of the natural elements. And see, the natural elements have pure frequencies. And the divine energy always flows through the natural elements. So first we're going to resonate with the natural element. And then we're going to ask the angels to come using the natural element to awaken the energy channels. So since we're all sitting here now, maybe there's not that many natural elements, we can think about the earth. The earth is always beneath us. Imagine the earth below you supporting you. Mother Earth holding us 
loving us and would do our little prayer. Dear God, our hearts are open to you. Please come. We need your help to awaken the energy channels. Use the earth to awaken the energy channels. Using the earth, resonate with the earth frequency to awaken the energy channels. And using the earth frequencies, send your healing angels to heal our bodies, to open the channels. Using the earth, ground us, give us stability, give us strength. Right now, here we are. So repeat the phrase, it's just the intention, dear God, our hearts are open to you, please come. We need your help. Use the earth to heal our hearts, to heal our body, to open the energy channels. Use the earth to open the energy channels in our fingertips to awaken the energy whenever we want. Using the earth, awaken the channels. Right now, using the earth, send your healing angels to awaken the channels in our fingertips. Right now, using the earth, send your healing angels to bless everyone listening to this visualization, this meditation, giving us peace, giving us groundedness, awaking the channels in our fingertips and we feel greater peace. We say thank you. And in thank you, we mean thank you, God. Through your grace, by your healing angels, using Mother Earth, the ground beneath us, we receive your blessings. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And that's a meditative state. Now you're feeling the energy. Now let's say you're, uh, you're a chanter. One of my chants that I like to sing, I'll, sing, I'll just continue to hold on to the energy using the earth, connected to the earth, sending your healing angels. Notice what happens if I chant. There's a little chant. I think an anchor to that part of me. May all beings be happy. May all beings be safe. May all beings everywhere be free. May all beings be happy. May all beings be safe. May all beings everywhere be free. And one more time. May all beings be happy. May all beings be safe. And may all beings everywhere be free. Feel love in your heart. And feel compassion. You can meditate on happiness. And throughout the day, you'll notice I'm happier. So right now, you just have the thought as you're feeling the energy. Hold the idea. Today, I'll be happy. Today, I am happy. Happiness. Happiness. Recall something that makes you happy. Think of something else that makes you happy. And of course, that evokes gratitude. Feel gratitude for all that you have in your life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you have a mantra meditation, say your mantra is Om, and you'd be going Om, 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 and feel the energy at the same time. Or you do breathing meditation, where you notice your breath. Breathe in light. Breathe out darkness. Any stress in your body, let it go. Breathe it in through your fingertips. Send it out into the earth, any of the pain, any of the frustration, any of the darkness. 
Let Mother Earth take it and heal it. Breathe in light and love. Exhale, sadness. Take a moment to reflect on your emotions. Think about something in your life that you regret. Feel that regret as you feel the energy in your fingertips. Feel how you tend to be hard on yourself, holding on to not loving yourself fully because of that regret, feeling shame, feeling guilty. Just feel that part of you. And now let it go. Give it to the mother. Take away my guilt. Take away my shame. Please forgive me. Help me to love myself again. Right now, restore the innocence. I'm doing my best. Restore the innocence. If you do therapy, imagine in front of you a little child feeling guilty, feeling sad, feeling unlovable, feeling the energy in your fingertips. Surround that little child with love and light. I forgive you. I love you. I believe in you. You deserve my love. I always love you. And give yourself love. And feel the energy at the same time. And as we fill up and receive energy and blessings, it's always good to end with blessing the world. So we'll come back to that one simple little blessing that could be many. Could be thinking about people in front of you that you love and sending them love. And one way to express that love is May you be happy. May you feel safe. And may you be free. May all beings be happy. May all beings be safe. And may all beings everywhere be free. And in expressing that, we are fulfilling our purpose in this world. We are all agents of the divine here to make a difference. And in this moment, we know that we are needed. And the universe is here to support us in fulfilling our, our journey and our destiny. Thank you. So we'll complete the meditation. Rub your hands together as a way of kind of creating a little warmth and touching your face. Taking a deep breath. So I was demonstrating how you can use feeling the energy with any form of meditation. It just enriches it. Did you find that energy flowing at times in your body? Powerful, powerful, yeah. It was delightful to meditate with you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, John. And that's a mighty, woohoo! <laughs> okay, that sounds great. <laughs> well, thank you so much. This has been a pleasure and a treat. I can't thank you enough for being on the show, John. A real pleasure for me too. You have a great day. You too. So for everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get beyond Mars and Venus, and work toward your happily ever after, and shine bright. Woohoo! Thank you so much, John. Thank you. A real delight. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also, leave your comments. Have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're going to get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, InspireNationShow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else, and useful and helpful resources to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs>